Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in-house to be so kind to check your cell phones and that they have been turned off. Uh, we will post the program within 24 hours on the Heritage homepage for your future reference. And of course, our questioners online are welcome to send any comments or questions simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Introducing our first guest and primary speaker uh, is our director of the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies here at Heritage, my colleague, John Malcolm. John? Welcome. Uh, I am delighted uh, to welcome you to the last of our seven uh, Preserve the Constitution uh, events. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the series. Of course, if you missed uh, any of those prior events, they're all available on, uh, online. Now, next Tuesday, the United States Supreme Court is going to hear uh, oral argument in the case of Bond versus United States. This is a somewhat bizarre, uh, but a very important case that is going to determine whether or not our federal government is truly a limited uh, government, as we were all told in school, or whether Congress has the ability to use the treaty power to expand its powers beyond those enumerated in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution in order to enact legislation that can impact our individual liberties as well as the balance of power between the federal government and the states. We have an excellent panel uh, today that will discuss uh, this issue and its ramifications, and my colleague uh, Andrew Kloster will introduce our panelists a little later in the program. Uh, we're going to begin, however, with a keynote address uh, from Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. Perhaps you've heard of him. Senator Cruz actually knows a lot about this topic, uh, in addition to the fact that he clerked for uh, then Chief Justice William Rehnquist after graduating from my alma mater, Harvard Law School. Uh, prior to becoming a U.S. Senator, uh, Senator Cruz was the Solicitor General from the state of Texas, and he has argued uh, nine cases before the High Court. One of those cases, which he won by the, uh, by the way, uh, was Medellin versus Texas which dealt with the binding nature of international commitments on domestic law, which are some of the issues that the court will be considering in the Bond case. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Senator Ted Cruz. Well, thank you, John, and good morning. And it is great to be with you, and it's great to be back with so many friends at Heritage. For all of you here, I, I would encourage you to settle down, get comfortable, uh, and, and I will do my very, very best to keep my remarks to under 21 hours. <laughs> Let me say at the outset also, it is, it is a particular privilege being here at Heritage. Heritage pl plays such an important role in helping articulate and defend conservative principles across this country. And in no fight has that been more apparent than in the fight over Obamacare, over stopping the enormous harms that are coming from Obamacare. Heritage has played an absolutely leading role in helping lead that fight, and I certainly am grateful to be fighting alongside Heritage. Now, the topic this morning is not Obamacare, uh, but is instead two of my favorite topics in the world, one of which is U.S. national sovereignty, uh, and the other of which uh, is the structural constraints that are present in the Constitution that protect our liberty. And, and both of these are implicated by the Supreme Court's case, Bond versus United States. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about Medellin versus Texas, which John mentioned. Uh, and tell you a little bit of the background of Medellin because that's a case with which I was intimately involved. Uh, and then transition over to talking about Bond and how many of the issues in Medellin are implicated in Bond and go to core issues of sovereignty and the structural protections of our liberty. Medellin is a case that began with, with a horrific crime uh, that occurred in Texas in the early 1990s where, where two teenage girls uh, were tragically attacked uh, and murdered by a gang. 
and it was as ugly a criminal case in terms of what happened to those little girls as, as you would ever see. And, and the case took a very, very strange turn because what happened in Medellin is one of the gang members, a fellow named Jose Ernesto Medellin, he was apprehended, he confessed in writing, uh, and he was convicted. But it, it so happens that, that Medellin uh, was a Mexican national. He had been born in the nation of Mexico. And although he had lived almost his entire life in the U.S., he had come to the U.S. as a very small child, uh, he was technically speaking still a Mexican national. And there are a series of international treaties, uh, most notably the Vienna Convention on Consular Affairs, that provide that when an individual in a signatory nation is arrested in a foreign nation, that you have a right to contact your consulate. The consulate has a right to provide you assistance. And it's been interpreted as putting an affirmative duty on the arresting officials to inform you of that right. There's no dispute. Nobody informed Medellin of his right to contact the Mexican consulate. So he was convicted. He was sentenced to death. And some four years later, on, on federal habeas review, on, on a collateral review of his convictions, his lawyers raised for the first time the Vienna Convention issue. And roughly concurrently, the nation of Mexico sued the United States in the International Court of Justice, which is the World Court, based on the Vienna Convention. And the World Court issued a decision in a case called Avena that was a remarkable decision. It, it was a decision that purported to order the United States to reopen the convictions of 51 murderers across this country, all of whom were Mexican nationals, all of whom had been convicted of murder, all of whom, for one reason or another, local law enforcement had not informed them of their right to contact the Mexican consulate. That was the first instance of a foreign court trying to bind the United States and bind our criminal justice system. It was an extraordinary assertion of power by the world court. Well, unsurprisingly, Medellin's lawyers immediately began seizing upon this decision from the world court and saying under the world court, he was entitled to have his conviction reopened. And the case went to the US Supreme Court twice. I argued it twice in front of the US Supreme Court. Uh, I guess the first time we didn't do a good enough job because we had to have a do-over the second time. The case took an even stranger wrinkle, though, because while the case was pending, the President of the United States, whom I would note was a Republican, George W. Bush, signed a two-paragraph order that purported to order the state courts to obey the world court. Uh, it, was, it was an extraordinary order. And so the second time we argued Medellin, when it was Medellin versus Texas, there were two issues before the Supreme Court. Number one, does the world court have the authority to bind the U.S. justice system, to reopen final criminal convictions? And number two, does the President of the United States have the authority to order the state courts to submit to the authority of the world court. Now those were, for anyone who is a student or fan of constitutional law and the constraints upon the exercise of federal powers, th these were issues that really go to the heart of federalism, go, go to the heart of separations of powers. And Texas argued in Medellin that the answer to both of those questions was resoundingly no, that the world court had no authority to bind the U.S. justice system, both because the treaties at issue were not what is called self-executing. And in treaty speak, and, and for those of y'all who, who don't carry the burden in life of being lawyers, uh, th there is a distinction of two different types of treaties, those that are self-executing and those that are non-self-executing. A self-executing treaty has binding domestic legal force by virtue of its ratification. It doesn't need anything additional to have binding domestic legal force. A non-self-executing treaty is essentially a contract between nations. 
but it doesn't have binding domestic legal force unless and until Congress, in conjunction with the president, passes legislation giving it binding legal force. So those are the two types. In Medellin, the Vienna Convention on Consular Affairs was non-self-executing, which means everyone agreed it didn't have binding legal force. One of the things the president was effectively trying to do with his memo was unilaterally transform a non-self-executing treaty into a self-executing treaty that is binding. And the Supreme Court in Medellin it was interesting. Just about every pundit, just about every academic, just about every uh, media outlet covering Medellin thought that, that, that we didn't have a prayer. That, that, that was the conventional wisdom. I remember actually Heritage organized a moot for me to get ready for the argument that was incredibly helpful. And at the end of the day, the Supreme Court ended up agreeing with Texas across the board. We won 6-3 with a victory where the court concluded, number one, the world court has no authority whatsoever to bind the U.S. justices. And number two, the President of the United States has no authority to order the state courts to obey the world court. Uh, those were both incredibly significant decisions going to US sovereignty and also going to the structural constraints on government. All right, so let's fast forward to Bond versus United States, case that the Supreme Court is getting ready to consider. Now, Bond, a Pennsylvania woman named Carol Ann Bond, committed a local crime, an unfortunate crime. She discovered that, that her husband uh, had been with another woman and, and had impregnated another woman. And she was pretty unhappy about that. Um, I, I, I have to admit as an aside, you know, one of my favorite characters in Washington uh, was Dick Armey. And, and one of the, my favorite things Dick Armey ever said is, is during the, the height of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Someone asked Dick Army, uh, the leader, leader Army, Leader Army, what would you say uh, if you had been President Bill Clinton? And Army's response, he said, well, I wouldn't say much of anything because I'd have been lying in a pool of my own blood and Mrs. Army would be saying, how do I reload this darn thing? <laughs> so Mrs. Bond, uh, was not quite as drastic as, as Mrs. Army might have been, but she nonetheless got a chemical and put it on the mailbox and doorknob of this woman, and, and, this, and the, the, this, this other woman b suffered burns from this chemical. Now, well, look, it's an unfortunate act of assault. It's something state law, state criminal law, for hundreds of years has been able to handle. If you use chemicals to burn someone, you'll be prosecuted. That's assault, and, and that's our criminal justice system works pretty well on that. Except she wasn't prosecuted locally. <coughs> she was prosecuted instead for violating the Chemical Weapons Convention Implementation Act, uh, which is a treaty. It's an act that was implementing a treaty prohibiting chemical weapons. Now, in this case, it wasn't sarin gas that was used. It wasn't something typically understood as chemical weapons in the sense of weapons of mass destruction that are typically the subject of these treaties. It was chemicals that were harmful and, and burned this one. And the central question in Bond is whether a treaty can expand the authority of the federal government beyond the constitutional limits that would otherwise apply. That is a tremendously important question. And, and I would note that, that at the heart of what's at issue in Bond is a famous sentence from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1920 in a case called Missouri versus Holland, where in that case, the court wrote, quote, if a treaty is valid, there can be no dispute about the validity of the statute implementing it, 
on our, under Article 1, Section 8, as a necessary and proper means to execute the powers of the government. Now that snippet, that sentence has been relied upon over and over again for the proposition that the treaty clause can be used to circumvent the structural limits on the power of the federal government. Now I have to tell you in my view that proposition is an absurd proposition that the treaty clause can subsume, can trump every other structural protection of the federal government but that phrase has been cited for that proposition over and over again. Indeed in Medellin the federal government relied on Missouri versus Holland and said, well, yes, yes, it, it, it is unusual. In fact, the Department of Justice was quite candid. They said unprecedented for the president to attempt to order the state courts to obey the world court. But under Missouri versus Holland, the treaty clause enables all sorts of things you would, that wouldn't be able to happen otherwise. I will note, by the way, as, a, as an aside, I want to go back to Medellin for a second. We had an interesting array of amici in Medellin who supported the state of Texas, who came in supporting the state of Texas, because in my view, Medellin was a separation of powers case. It was about protecting the authority of Congress, protecting the authority of the Supreme Court, and protecting against executive overreach. And in particular, we had one brief that was signed by a number of law professors, including John Yu, who many of you would know, will know who is an academic, who is a friend, who is known as one of the most conservative law professors in the country and one of the most vigorous advocates of robust executive authority. That same brief was also signed by Professor Erwin Chemerinsky, who's the dean of the University of California at Irvine, who is very well known as one of the most liberal law professors in the country. Uh, I am not aware of any other issue in which John Yu and Erwin Chemerinsky have joined forces. Uh, they both joined a brief supporting Texas and Medellin, and why did they do so? Because the potential, if in the context of a treaty, the president had the authority to pick and choose which laws to follow, that had enormous potential for damage to our structural constitutional system going forward. Indeed, I'm reminded of when I found out about the President's order in Medellin, the then U.S. Solicitor General, Paul Clement, called me on the phone. Paul is an old friend, and Paul said, this was February of 2005. And Paul said, Ted, are you sitting down? Now that's a bad sign. <laughs> when the conversation begins with, are you sitting down, you're, you're pretty sure the rest of it is not going to end up the way you want. And Paul explained to me that the President had decided to sign this order, ordering the state courts to obey the world court, and then Paul, being a good soldier, made the argument, but, but look, you should be very, very comforted because the president keeps his finger on the trigger. The president gets to decide when to implement this new power. And, and my response on the phone, I said, number one, Paul, given how it's being implemented right now to undermine the convictions of 51 murderers across this country, that, that does not give me much comfort. But number two, Paul, there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and his children. Even if you're arguing George W. Bush will constrain this power, he's not going to be the last president to serve in office. And a president that has the authority to set aside U.S. law is a president that has far more authority than the Constitution gives any president. And so how did John Yu and Erwin Chemerinsky come together? Because on each of them, you know, I called each of them and, and, and made the case. Uh, and, I, and I said, you know, imagine, you know, with, when you were talking to a conservative, we had a number of conservatives, imagine, tried to pick a specter that in 2005 would, would deeply concern conservatives, imagine a President Hillary Clinton who decided to use this new power to set aside state laws with which she disagreed in the name of international comedy, in the name of not even enforcing mandatory <coughs> treaty obligations, but simply comedy between the nations, which was the predicate for the Medellin order. 
Imagine, for example, a President Hillary Clinton signing a two-paragraph order setting aside the marriage laws in all 50 states and saying every state shall now allow gay marriage because I have determined this would further international comedy. Or another example, imagine a President Hillary Clinton saying, you know, our allies really don't like that a number of states have capital punishment laws. So I'm writing a two-paragraph order setting aside the state capital punishment laws in every state because this would further international comedy. And I argued, listen, no matter what you think of the president, the president doesn't have the authority to flick state laws off of the books on whim and judgment. Now with Professor Chemerinsky, I tried to pick the most terrifying thing a liberal law professor could ever imagine. I said, imagine President Dick Cheney. <laughs> Irwin began breathing heavily on that, at that point. And I said, it is not at all difficult to imagine, for example, a, a President Dick Cheney saying, you know, California environmental laws limit productivity. Our allies, they have global multinational corporations. They're unhappy. I therefore set aside all California environmental laws. Or for that matter, tort reform. You know, those pesky trial lawyers keep suing people. I therefore decree there shall be no punitive damages in the United States of America. Now look, some people in this room might like that as a policy outcome. Whether you like it or not, it is unequivocal the President of the United States doesn't have the authority under our constitutional system to simply decree it by whim. That unified the left and the right in Medellin saying, regardless of who the president is, we don't want that much power arrogated to the president. Well, let's go to Bond. You know, there are two types of restrictions you can think of that ostensibly the treaty power could get around. One are explicit prohibitions. The Bill of Rights. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll read you again the sentence from Missouri versus Holland. If a treaty is valid, there can be no dispute about the validity of the statute implementing it under Article I, Section 8 as a necessary and proper means to execute the powers of government. Now, surely, it cannot be the case that the president could sign a treaty, say, giving away our First Amendment rights. By the way, if you go to Europe, the First Amendment is an alien concept in Europe. The notion of hate speech is something that is prosecuted. But surely it cannot be the case that the President of the United States could circumvent the First Amendment, could restrict the freedom of the press, could restrict our freedom of speech, could restrict our freedom of free exercise of religion through simply signing a treaty, finding some nation somewhere signing a treaty and somehow getting the Senate to ratify it. Surely it could not be the case, as this President is trying to do with the UN Small Arms Treaty, that a treaty could be used as a backdoor way to undermine the individual protections of the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. The Bill of Rights would be a hollow document indeed if all of those protections, if every one of the Bill of Rights was read as having an asterisk at the end, unless a treaty is passed that takes away this right. And I would note in Medellin the second time, Chief Justice Roberts asked a question that went right to this. Chief Justice Roberts asked the opposing counsel, Medellin's lawyer, he said, well, what about if the world court had simply said the arresting officers that failed to notify Medellin of his consular right lock them up and throw them in jail for five years. Suppose the world court had ordered that. Go and arrest that man and put him in jail for five years. Now that contravenes a number of provisions of our Bill of Rights, including the right to trial by jury. And the Chief Justice's question is, you, you can't possibly be arguing that simply because of the President's order, the United States would be obliged to go arrest the arresting officer and throw him in jail five years because it would further comedy. That question, if you put it in the bond context, is exactly can a treaty circumvent the express prohibitions, the rights in the Bill of Rights?
But there's a second question, a related question, and, and one that really is the heart of Bond, which is, okay, if it can't, and I think most people would agree that you can't use a treaty to undermine the Bill of Rights and the explicitly prohibited actions and powers of government. Well, then the second question is, well, are the structural limits on the power of the federal government different? Now, some would say yes. Uh, there are some, particularly in the legal academy, that view the structural limits as, as really all but non-existent kind of details. And well, if it's a treaty, yeah, you, you can get around those. I have to say, in my view, I think the structural limits were fundamentally about protecting individual liberty, about restraining governmental power to protect the liberty of the citizens. And I would note, also at Medellin, the issue of structural limits on government was raised a couple of times. One, with regard to the president's order in Medellin, the Department of Justice argued that the president had authoritatively interpreted the, the treaty, and that was binding. And I got to tell you, there, there are very rare times in the life of a lawyer where you get to go into a court, particularly the Supreme Court of the United States, and argue relying as a principal authority on Marbury versus Madison to stand before the Supreme Court and say, Mr. Chief Justice, it is emphatically the province and duty of this court to say what the law is. And yet that was very much our argument there, that in attempting to impose a binding interpretation of the treaty that was contrary to what the Supreme Court had said, that the president was usurping the Article III authority of the Supreme Court of the United States. And we argued no treaty could give away the Article III decision-making power of our courts to another body. That exceeded the treaty writing authority to hand over the core constitutional responsibility of our federal courts. Now I'll note the first time Medellin was argued, Justice Scalia asked a question quite similar to this, but he asked Mr. Medellin's lawyer, he said, tell me, do you think that the president could sign a treaty making Kofi Annan the commander-in-chief of our U.S. Armed Forces. Could the President of the United States, by treaty, give away his core Article II authority? Now, Medellin's lawyer didn't really have an answer to that question. Because the answer is self-evidently no. Of course not. Of course the President could not make anybody else commander-in-chief except for the President of the United States, who is the only individual given the authority to be commander in chief under Article II of the Constitution. But the problem is, if he said that, that immediately said, well, then what it led to the follow up question, which is, if he can't give away his Article II power, why could the president give away our Article III power? But what it would also open the door to if a treaty is not bound by the structural limitations, either of separation of powers between Article I, Article II, Article III, the different branches of government, or federalism and the Tenth Amendment, the, the, the limits between the federal government and the states. What that would do is essentially say that the principles of federalism, the structural limitations on the federal government, that they're second-class constitutional provisions. Unlike the Bill of Rights, the, these, these other ones don't really matter a whole lot. So, for example, the Lopez decision, landmark decision of the Rehnquist Court that struck down the Federal Gun Free School Zones Act as being beyond the authority of Congress to legislate something that was purely intrastate. Gun Free School Zones Act was justified as a matter of regulating interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court, in a decision my former boss, Chief Justice Rehnquist, wrote, said, look, we start with first principles. And it is beyond the authority of Congress to regulate what should be a local state criminal matter. Now, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be illegal. It's just not everything that is illegal has to be illegal as a federal matter. There's a reason we have 50 states and local governments. If the meeting of the Missouri versus Holland snippet 
is that a treaty can circumvent the enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8, that you don't need to ask, does Congress have the authority to legislate here to begin with? Then it means there's an easy way around the Lopez decision. You simply sign a treaty with anybody that says, we're going to agree to ban guns in all of our schools. You get it ratified, and if it's no longer relevant, does the federal government have the authority to regulate purely local matters? you suddenly have a back door giving the federal government the authority to do it anyway. Another issue similar to that is the Morrison case, where the court struck down a portion of the Violence Against Women Act. Now listen, everyone agrees violence against women and against anybody is a terrible thing and should be punished and should be punished vigorously. And indeed, in this case, Ms. Bond used chemicals to burn someone else. There's no doubt that assuming those are the facts, that she should face criminal prosecution for that conduct. The question is, who should prosecute? Under which law? And what the court concluded in Morrison is, listen, the states have, for centuries, had robust laws protecting against violence on a purely local matter. There's no need for a federal law governing violence between two individuals on a purely local level that doesn't cross state lines, that doesn't impl implicate interstate commerce. That is a matter our Constitution has left to the states. If the broad interpretation of the Missouri versus Holland snippet is accurate, Morrison can go away very easily. You now have a roadmap. If you find the limitations on the federal government's authority irksome, any president has a simple path to get around it. Find any nation, doesn't matter which nation, any nation anywhere in the world. Negotiate a treaty agreeing to do what you couldn't do otherwise. And if the Senate ratifies it, and by the way, that means you can cut the House of Representatives at everything, then suddenly the federal government has authority it didn't have before. I would suggest to you that is a radical interpretation of the treaty power. And, and that is what is at issue in bond, is does the treaty power enable the federal government to circumvent the structural limitations on the authority of the federal government? Now, Missouri versus Holland, it may be possible for the court to distinguish that, that case. There are grounds on which you can distinguish it, but if you can't distinguish it, then Missouri versus Holland should be overruled. Because the proposition that the treaty clause is a trump card that defeats all of the remaining structural limitations on, on the federal government is, is not a proposition that is logically defensible. So that's what the court's going to be wrestling with. In Medellin versus Texas, they did the right thing. They defended US sovereignty. They upheld the structural limitations on government power, which serves to protect individual liberty. And it is my hope that in Bond versus the United States, the Supreme Court does the same thing, that it interprets the treaty power with an eye towards the Tenth Amendment, with an eye towards our federalist system and the structural limitations on the federal government, and with an eye towards protecting United States sovereignty. Thank you. The senator has uh, graciously uh, noted that he will take some questions now. We have time for a few. So pl if you please wait for the uh, mic and ask a question uh, rather than make a, you know, treat his speech, uh, that would be great. So uh, right there. Yes, sir. So I'm pleased to be among all these literary uh, legal scholars, so I hope you can clarify something for me. In the Medellin case, the president was effectively precluded from picking and choosing the laws he chose to enforce. Yet I've seen, we've noticed in the last five years or so, the president has pick and, picked and choose lots of laws to enforce, uh, employer mandate, border enforcement. How is it that that happens now so routinely? The question you ask is a terrific question. Uh, and, and it is one of the most disturbing aspects uh, of President Obama's administration. This administration has not respected rule of law and has consistently flouted 
the constitutional limits on the authority of the president. Uh, as you note, the president has picked and chosen which laws to enforce and which laws not to enforce. Uh, in the immigration context, the president simply announced he wasn't going to enforce certain aspects of our immigration law. In the drug context, the attorney general announced they weren't going to enforce aspects of our drug law. Now, as a policy matter, it may be that some people in this room agree with those policy decisions. Maybe those are particularly on the drug side. I think you would find people both on the right and left that think there may be some reasonable modifications of drug laws. But prior to this presidency, the way you, you had reasonable modifications of federal law is you went to Congress, you introduced legislation, you worked with elected representatives of both parties, you passed a change in the law, and you signed it into law. That's the way the constitutional system works. What this president has begun doing, and it's a very disturbing pattern, is simply saying we're not going to work with Congress to get it changed. As the President said in two State of the Union addresses, if Congress doesn't act, I will. That is a dangerous assertion of power. You know, the President under Article II has, has a constitutional obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. If you look at Obamacare, the pattern on Obamacare has been really stunning. We all know big business has gotten a one-year delay in Obamacare. Why? Because the president decreed it to be so. The statute applies on January 1. Now, for a couple of hundred years, when a statute says there is a legal obligation that applies on January 1, it meant on January 1 that legal obligation kicked in. This administration simply said, no, we're not enforcing that law. And in fact, they did so through a blog post from a mid-level Treasury staffer that was posted on a Friday afternoon. That pattern, I think, is very dangerous. And, and I'll note two things on it. Number one, in the Senate, uh, I'm the ranking member on the Constitution Subcommittee. And, and in that capacity, we have put out a report detailing assertions of federal power by this administration. Bold, broad, aggressive assertions of federal power that this administration has made before the United States Supreme Court that have been rejected 9-0. And this report I would commend to all of you to go through. They argue that the federal government has the authority to put a GPS on your cars, with no probable cause, no reasonable suspicion, just to know where you are. Now, as I read it, I thought the Fourth Amendment had something to say about that. And fortunately, the Supreme Court agreed, and 9-0 said, no, the Obama administration doesn't have that authority. There was another case, Hosanna Tabor, where there's an exchange that we quote in this report between the Obama Justice Department lawyer, and Justice Elena Kagan. Now, you will recall Justice Kagan was the Solicitor General under President Obama, and I think it's fair to, to I think all would agree that Justice Kagan is not a right-wing kook. This exchange with Justice Kagan, she asks the, the Obama Justice Department lawyer, is it your position that the First Amendment says nothing about whether and how a church may hire its ministers and the employees who work for the church. And the answer from the Justice Department lawyer was, we see nothing in the First Amendment that addresses the ability of a church to decide who its pastors are going to be and who work for the church. And Justice Kagan, from the bench, said, I find that position remarkable. That is from the bench, President Obama's own Solicitor General saying, the idea that the First Amendment is irrelevant to the question of how churches select their ministers? And 9-0, the Supreme Court rejected. 
So I would commend that report to everyone to see a catalog of egregious assertions of federal power. And the second final point I'd make on this, Medellin versus Texas. Unfortunately, there the president who made an assertion of overbroad federal power was George W. Bush. He's a Republican, the former governor of the state of Texas. And yet I'm very proud that the state of Texas went before the U.S. Supreme Court and said, no president, even if he is the former governor of Texas and a Republican, no president has the authority to give away U.S. sovereignty. And I would note one of the things that is disturbing is the almost total absence of Democrats speaking out at the abuse of executive power by the Obama administration. I spoke out very loudly when it was a Republican administration abusing its power. I thought it was striking when Rand Paul did his filibuster on drone policy that only one Democrat showed up on the, on the floor to support us, that was Ron Wyden. The other 53 Democrats apparently had no concerns if the administration used drones to target U.S. citizens. And I hope in time, you know, there have been historically Democrats who have been genuine civil libertarians, who have been concerned about overbroad power in the federal executive. And I hope in time you will see some Democrats with the courage to speak out and say, even if I might agree with this policy, the president doesn't have the authority to decree it unilaterally. And any time you see too much power arrogated in the president, it undermines the liberty of everyone. Question? Thanks. Senator, thanks for spending the time to uh, talk about the, the treaties and some of the background. And um, I wanted to ask about uh, a specific treaty. I think um, it's the subject, it's likely going to be a subject of a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing coming up. I'm sure you're very familiar with it, um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And so today you've brought up how important it is. These are important things, and there's, there's other implications. And so just briefly, um, uh, my name's Chris Nowim. I'm a Iraq veteran. I, I work at Vets First Veteran Service Organization. I'm sitting here with Jeff Steele from American Legion. And most of our work usually focuses on bills, uh, legislation, uh, House Veteran Affairs Committee, Senate Veteran Affairs Committee, rarely treaties. Um, this is a treaty that veteran service organizations are supporting because of the, the relationship with dis disabled veterans. And I know you're probably familiar with it. And um, why we're supporting it is kind of the, the overseas travel, you know, retired military, disabled veterans living overseas. And so um, I'm pretty sure you're probably opposed to it. But I guess the question is, through the, the RUDS process or reservations, understandings, and declarations, do you, could you speak a little bit to how important those are to make a treaty better or to make them amenable uh, to, you know, a, a conservative senator like yourself? How important is that? And uh, you know, the, uh, our veteran community is supporting it. So, is there a way where we can be uh, a resource or or help it be better in that respect? If, if you could speak to that, and thanks in advance. Well, thank you for that question. Let me say thank you to your work with our veterans, which is incredibly important. You know, the the, the treaty with disability, when it's come up before the Senate, it has not been ratified. And and the reason it hasn't been ratified it was, and and I was not. Uh, serving in the Senate the last time it was voted, so I have not, not had the opportunity to vote on it yet. But the reason it wasn't ratified uh, was because of concerns of U.S. sovereignty. In the United States, we have vigorous laws, indeed laws that lead the world in terms of protecting the rights of those with disabilities. The Americans with Disability Act uh, expands the access for people with disabilities and, and made major inroads in terms of allowing people who previously had not been able to access public facilities to be able to access public facilities. That's existing law now. The concern over the disability treaty is that it would undermine sovereignty by creating the ability to use international bodies to enforce extant legal obligations on the United States without going through the legislative process without going through Congress. That's the concern. It is a real concern. I would note, in terms of access elsewhere, 
other countries who have signed on, to the extent they wish to comply with the treaty, will do so regardless of whether the U.S. ratifies that treaty. If other, other, other nations that have signed on decide to expand their access, which, which is the, the issue you're focused on, they're going to do it or not regardless of whether the United States is a signatory because there are other nations that are signatories. And, and I would note what happens sometimes in these treaty issues. You, you, you saw this in Medellin. The nation of Mexico argued in front of the World Court and argued in front of the Supreme Court that the U.S. should be bound by the judgment of the World Court. And in fact, we had 90 foreign nations come in against the state of Texas in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, arguing that the U.S. justice system should be bound by the judgment of the foreign court. Do you know how many of those 90 nations enforce judgments of the World Court in their courts? Zero. It literally was 90 nations saying the United States alone should give up its sovereignty. We have never done this and we don't intend to. But the United States should do so. That's part of the concern with the Disability Treaty is that ratification is not going to materially change the degree of compliance by foreign nations, but it is going to open avenues to undermine sovereignty and challenge U.S. law. And, and I think if those issues are not adequately dealt with, I think the treaty is unlikely to be ratified. With that, I just want to thank you all for being here, and God bless you all. <laughs>
I'm just going to um, talk a bit more about uh, Bond and try to explain maybe uh, in a bit more detail quite why I agree with the Senator that um, this proposition from Missouri v. Holland is inconsistent with a constitutional structure. So uh, as the Senator explained, Missouri v. Holland seemed to say that if we enter into a treaty promising to do something, then Congress automatically gets the power to do that thing, even if they didn't have the power before. Uh, or to put it another way, a treaty can increase the legislative power of Congress. So that was Justice Holmes in 1920 in Missouri v. Holland in uh, one sentence that the senator quoted. Uh, now, I can tell you, the senator didn't tell you this, um, the opinion, the entire opinion, is five pages, and there is no reasoning whatsoever surrounding that sentence. It is simply an assertion in Missouri v. Holland, and that has been the conventional wisdom since 1920. In 2005, I wrote an article in the Harvard Law Review arguing that that is incorrect, that a treaty can, in fact, not increase the legislative power of Congress, and now that's the issue that's teed up in Bond. So uh, again, the senator gave you the facts. Mrs. Bond uh, poisons her, attempts to poison her neighbor with some toxic chemicals. This is, of course, all kinds of different state crimes. But instead of being prosecuted for any of those state crimes, she's prosecuted by an ambitious assistant US attorney for violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention Implementation Act. Mrs. Bond says, um, where does Congress get power to enact this thing? Whence the power to enact this statute? Uh, usually when you're interested in congressional power, you flip to Article I, Section 8 of the US Constitution. It's a list of enumerated powers of the Congress. Mrs. Bond flips open to Article I, Section 8 and says, I, I don't see this on the list. I don't see this regulating of the chemical weapons here on the list. And so where does Congress get this power? And the government says, it doesn't matter that it's not on the list. It doesn't matter because the treaty gives us the power. We entered into this treaty, and thus we automatically have the power to enact this legislation. That's the government's claim. They say, uh, we automatically get this power because of this treaty, see Missouri v. Holland, right? So that is the government's claim. Uh, the government actually, as an aside, the government opened up with, Mrs. Bond, you don't have standing to make this argument. The Third Circuit accepted that. Um, Acting Solicitor General Neil Cottiel at the U.S. Supreme Court confessed error, said, well, wait a second, of course she's got standing to make this argument, and so the Supreme Court says 9-0, yes, you have standing to make this argument, went back down to the Third Circuit, and then on the merits, the Third Circuit said, yes, Congress has power to enact this thing. They are automatically given the power. See Missouri v. Holland, the treaty increases Congress's legislative power. But, said the Third Circuit, um, in not so many words, uh, this seems crazy to us. This seems crazy to us, and we urge the U.S. Supreme Court to have another look at it and the court has granted cert, and so that's the issue teed up in this case. Can a treaty increase the legislative powers of Congress? I'm just gonna quickly give you a couple of reasons why I think the answer is no. The senator uh, you know, well suggested the primary and most obvious answer. This proposition is just in deep tension with basic structural axioms of limited government. So uh, it's just a, it's axiomatic that Congress has limited powers and uh, that those powers can be increased. Uh, can, can, those powers are, as the Constitution puts it, herein granted. Congress shall have the powers herein granted and then a list, then a list, an enumerated uh, list. By the way, the executive power and the judicial power, they don't quite say that. It says the judicial power shall be vested in a Supreme Court and inferior courts. It says the, um, the executive power shall be vested in a president. But, first, but Article One says all legislative power herein granted shall be vested in, a con in uh, Congress of the United States. Um, why the difference in language? Well, the president's power is in a sense contingent on what Congress does. So if Congress passes a new statute giving, giving the president new power, passes a new statute, the president then will have 
new power to execute that statute. In fact, a new duty to execute that statute. So the president's power is, in a sense, uh, contingent on what Congress does. And the judicial power is, in a sense, contingent also. Because the judicial power is uh, the um, federal courts have jurisdiction over uh, federal questions, but Congress can change what a federal question is, right? If they enact a new statute, then there's a new federal question for the Supreme Court, for the uh, federal courts to adjudicate. Um, so there's a sense, at least, in which uh, the president's power is contingent. There's a sense in which the judicial power is contingent on acts of Congress. But Congress's power isn't. Congress's power isn't. It says all legislative powers herein granted. Congress's power can't change that way. It's not contingent. There's this list. So, and Missouri v. Holland seems in deep tension with that principle. Because if Missouri v. Holland is right, then a treaty can increase the legislative power of Congress. You know, to put that point another way, the only way that Congress's power really can be increased is by constitutional amendment, by Article 5. And there have been many such amendments where the amendment says, the, the final um, clause of the amendment is, Congress shall have power to enact appropriate legislation. So Congress has gotten new powers over the years via Article 5. Article 5 is quite a complicated mechanism, right? So there's you know, four different mechanisms in Article 5 for amending the Constitution and increasing Congress's power. But it's just hard to imagine that in addition to those five explicit and quite carefully wrought mechanisms in Article 5, that there's actually a fifth mechanism that's not mentioned in Article 5 by which you can increase the legislative powers of Congress. But that's what's implied in uh, Missouri v. Holland. Okay. So now, if that strikes you as odd, this idea, this idea that um, a treaty can increase the legislative power of Congress, consider this also implies that the legislative power of Congress can be decreased. Now, how is that? If a treaty has increased the power of Congress, what if the treaty goes away? So we enter into a treaty, then Congress passes a statute. They've been given the power by the Treaty of Missouri v. Holland. Now the treaty goes away. Um, uh, the executive branch's position is that the president can abrogate a treaty unilaterally on his own, on his own motion. The president can decide, I don't want any part of this treaty anymore. If Missouri v. Holland is right, he would thus be rendering a U.S. statute unconstitutional, right? Because now there isn't the authority for that statute anymore. So, um, uh, you know, normally the president gets only a few days to either veto a statute or sign it. And once those few days have passed, then the president has no further power over the existence of that statute. But this will be a special category. In this category, the president can render these statutes unconstitutionally on his own motion for any reason at all, if Missouri v. Holland is right. So isn't that odd to think about? Now, if that strikes you as odd, consider the president's not the only one who can abrogate treaties. So our treaty partners can do this too. Our treaty partners can abrogate treaties. Now, so wouldn't it have struck the framers as strange to imagine that a US statute duly enacted, voted on by the House, voted on by the Senate, signed by the President, U.S. statute, suddenly rendered unconstitutional at the discretion of, for example, the King of England. Would that not have struck the framers as odd? After all, the, the prime, the first objection in the Declaration of Independence was foreign control over U.S. law. Here, in, if Missouri v. Holland is right, the, our treaty partners can render U.S. statutes unconstitutional. Isn't this bizarre to think about? And I'll just make the structural point one additional way. Um, the framers were deeply concerned about the tendency of, uh, the fe of a government, but particularly the federal government, and particularly the legislative branch of the federal government to pull more, to, to uh, arrogate more power to itself, right? The tendency of legislative power to increase. They were deeply concerned about that. They were also deeply concerned about foreign entanglements, right? They were deeply concerned about the possibility they were gonna get sucked into these European conflicts and things, deeply concerned about international entanglements. So, but Missouri v. Holland, if, you, if those are your two big concerns, Missouri v. Holland is your worst nightmare because it creates this doubly perverse incentive. 
It's an incentive to enter into more international entanglements exactly so as to achieve more domestic legislative power. The framers would have hated that. So uh, um, uh, the senator gives the example of U.S. v. Lopez, right? Congress lacks the power to regulate guns near schools, see Lopez. The, the president then, the federal government then, has this perverse incentive to enter and find some other country somewhere that will agree with us about guns near schools, enter into a new international entanglement, and then thus have new domestic legislative power that they don't have before. So isn't this odd to think of that the Constitution creates this doubly perverse incentive that the framers would have hated? I suggest that this um, implication is inconsistent with this basic constitutional uh, structure. Now, so that's really the, um, the structure point. I'm just going to take two minutes and make for you the textual point as well. I mean, I think we've I think uh, hopefully the senator and I have successfully conveyed the, why this is inconsistent with constitutional structure. But just so you know the, the underlying constitutional text, there are two um, clauses at issue here. I'm just going to give them to you really quickly. The, um, so the necessary and proper clause says, Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. And the Treaty Clause in Article 2 provides that the President shall have power, bind with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the Senators present concur. Now, the thought is that these two clauses combined somehow entail that a treaty can increase the legislative power of Congress, and I just don't think it's so. So when you string together these two clauses, if you kind of parse them carefully, what they say is, again, and I'm just going to provide you sort of ellipses, stringing these together, this is how they fit together as a matter of grammar. The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution, dot, 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 the President's power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties. And what I say is that the key language here is the verb to make. Right? This is about the power to make treaties. Uh, so this clearly would entail power to pass legislation to help the president make a treaty like um, uh, appropriating some money to send John Jay over to negotiate the treaty it would, of course, capture uh, that. But this isn't that. This is, uh, this is statutes implementing treaties that have already been made, right? There's no sense in which the statute is helping to make a treaty. The treaty already exists, right? There already is the Chemical Weapons Convention. And uh, so the court actually saw this textual point very clearly in a case um, uh, about a statute. But the statutory language is quite similar. So the statutory langu language was the, um, the right to make contracts. It's very similar because it has the same verb to make. And it's also similar because, as the senator pointed out, a non-self-executing treaty is actually kind of like a contract, right? So to make contracts, to make treaties, here's the U.S. Supreme Court in Patterson. The right to make contracts does not extend as a matter of either logic or semantics to conduct after the contract relation has been established, including breach of the terms of the contract. Such post-formation conduct does not involve the right to make a contract, but rather implicates the performance of established contract obligations. I say this is exactly right, and it's flatly inconsistent with Missouri v. Hollins. This, these two clauses entail a power to, uh, to um, legislate in pursuance of making treaties, not, the pa not new powers to implement treaties already made. So for these text and structure reasons, seems to me that Missouri v. Holland is wrong, and Bond is a great opportunity for the Supreme Court to reverse this error. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, Steve Groves is now actually going to, I think, take a completely different tack and give you some examples of some of the treaties that might come up if the treaty power were expanded in this, or if the authority of Congress uh, were expanded in this way. Sure. Well, well Nick has uh, concentrated on some of the, the legal implications or ramifications. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the policy uh, implications. and how this might look over on the Hill. 
Uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who, um, who stayed for the remainder uh, of the event. I know that Nick and I don't carry uh, exact the same amount of star power as Ted Cruz. Um, so uh, we have <laughs> 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 sorry, I shouldn't have spoken for you. Uh, so I, I, I do um, thank you uh, for your interest and uh, for uh, being uh, polite. Um, hopefully, federal power will not be expanded by the court's upcoming decision in bond, uh, because if the federal power under the auspices of the treaty power is expanded, there really are no limits mm -hmm. as to what uh, mischief uh, may be achieved. And a great example of that potential mischief was gone into at great length by uh, Senator Cruz about Medellin. In that came, case, we became this close to having an order issued by an international court in the Avena case and forced against the state of Texas by our federal government. And the court's six to three decision should be considered a shot across the bow when it comes to the treaty power and the preservation of state sovereignty and uh, also American sovereignty. Uh, why did we have to come so close to having a crisis of federalism on our hands? What led us to that moment, which would have been uh, we were so close that but for the fact that Kennedy and Stevens decide to join with the conservative justices in that case. I grew up in Texas, and I can tell you that Texans are very independent folks, uh, to say the least. I doubt it would have sat well with them uh, if the federal government ordered them to provide additional hearings to these vicious death row inmates, uh, some of whom, the, the acts of uh, whom were described by uh, Senator Cruz, uh, because a court in the Netherlands had ordered the federal government to do so, and the Supreme Court had agreed. I don't think that would have gone over very well in Texas, at least not the Texas that I grew up in. And so we shouldn't forget that the federal government is still, to this day, brainstorming on how they can implement the ICJ's order in Avena. And one of the suggestions that they've had is that Congress should enact legislation to enforce the order. Um, but what we really shouldn't forget, and what we get back to the, you know, base questions here is, is why was that treaty at issue at all? Why did that treaty need to exist? Uh, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations is just a codification of longstanding principles of customary international law, so it might not even had to been there in the first place. Why did the United States feel it was necessary to exercise the treaty power to join the Vienna Convention and more so, <clears throat> why did they think it was a good idea to join the optional protocol that gave the ICJ jurisdiction over this case in the first place? And in our wisdom, we withdrew from that optional protocol in 2005. Just because, my point is, is that's just because the treaty power exists doesn't mean that we should be exercising it on a regular basis. This is a question of prudence, and the Medellin episode is a great example of how exercising the treaty power can come back to bite you in unexpected ways. And here at Heritage, our starting point when we're analyzing a situation like this is to start with um, America's first principles and the documents where those principles are enshrined. So the first questions we would ask is, you know, how did the founding fathers and the framers of the Constitution view this issue? And uh, what did they mean when they drafted the treaty power and how would they, as best as we can guess from their writings, apply it today? And when you start out asking these questions at that level, that fundamental level, uh, the answers become self-evident in my, in my view. And let's just take one example, the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court. Recall that the Declaration of Independence, which I believe, Nick, you brought up, uh, my favorite uh, part of that, uh, when we lay out all of our grievances for why, why we're going to declare our independence and very likely go to war, was that uh, for transporting us beyond the seas to be tried for pretended offenses. So fast forward to the Clinton administration and that under the treaty power, they were negotiating the Rome Statute and then they actually signed it. A treaty that would literally transport military officers and soldiers beyond the seas to the Netherlands in, in this particular case, to be tried for pretended offenses. When I say pretended offenses, I'm likely referring to war crimes that are actually not war crimes. Uh, 
like unavoidable civil civilian casualties in Afghanistan, for example. You know, I submit that signing the Rome Statute was not a prudential exercise of the treaty power because it would have given authority to the federal government that is not contemplated by the Constitution. Now, times change and the world changes, and many years have passed since the Declaration and the Constitution, uh, but does anyone really think that the authors of those documents would have conceived in their wildest imagination that the treaty power would be used to ship American <laughs> soldiers off to an international court to be tried for war crimes? The treaty power, when it's exercised, must be exercised prudentially. Bilateral tax treaties, maritime boundary agreements, these are the types of treaty that help the U.S. sort out its relationships with its neighbors and with other countries and is a valid and prudential use of the power. But when a treaty would infringe on American sovereignty, the treaty power is very likely being abused and federal power is very likely being expanded. And so I doubt that the framers created the treaty power so it could be used to expand the power of the federal government which they were going to great lengths to make a federal government of limited powers, or to surrender the independence and sovereignty that they had just wrested away from England with a lot of blood and uh, a lot of pain. So although the framers did not and could not have the answers to all of the questions that face the United States you know, centuries later, uh, the principles remain the same. And so you look over at what's going on in the, in the Senate and with other treaties, and you have to ask about what would, they, what, the, what would the framers have thought about environmental treaties and the treaty power? What about human rights conventions or the UN arms trade treaty that Senator Cr uh, Cruz mentioned that the Obama administration just signed? You know, should the treaty power be used to force radical changes in America's energy production and usage, as would have been the case if the U.S. had ratified the Kyoto Protocol? Should the treaty power be used to authorize committees of so-called human rights experts sitting in Geneva to pass judgment on whether the United States is complying with vague international human rights standards? Right now, there are hearings uh, being scheduled over in the Senate to consider the U.N. Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, even though the Americans with Disabilities Act has been on the books for more than 20 years. To me, the answers to these questions are, are self-evident. And so the answer to the question posed by today's event, the title of today's event, you know, does the treaty power threaten our system of limited government? I believe the answer to that is likewise self-evident. Uh, the answer is, is that it depends on whether our president and our Congress and our Supreme Court continue to believe, as the framers did, that the Constitution created a federal government of limited and enumerated powers. And I don't think that's entirely clear uh, today looking at our president, our Congress, and our Supreme Court, but I guess we'll find out fairly soon uh, when the bond decision comes down. But regardless of what happens in the bond case, we should remain vigilant that the treaty power is not abused, that we remain true to the principles of the founders and the framers and continue the struggle to keep our federal government as one of limited and enumerated powers. Uh, so thank you again for sticking around, folks, and your attention. Uh, thank you very much. I think we do have a few moments for a uh, few minutes for questions, um, but I will take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first one uh, of Professor Rosencrantz. Um, it seems that that Steve kind of uh, believes that at least there's there are political reasons, constitutional first principles reasons why the president and the Senate uh, should take independent constitutional judgment of each treaty before they ratify it. Um, but one of the my questions is 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 what's going to happen in bond because there's a swing for the fences uh, sort of a route that they could take, which is subject matter limitations on the treaty power, the scope of the treaty power. Is that a feasible thing? And if not, what do you see as happening in bond? Well, so I don't think that's feasible at all. Nobody is arguing that this treaty is not a legitimate treaty. So uh, these are two distinct questions. One is, does the president have the power to enter into this treaty? Is it within the treaty power in Article 2? Everyone agrees that it is. Everyone agrees that it is that the president had the power to enter into the Chemical Weapons Convention. 
This is posing the distinct question of whether when the president enters into such a treaty, that automatically increases the legislative power of Congress. So that's what's at issue in the case. Now, the court, what, what I am hoping the court will do is say, cleanly say no. A treaty cannot increase the legislative power of Congress, period. They have, though, many uh, off-ramps before that clear holding. They could say something like, we hereby construe the statute narrowly not to reach her facts, or we construe the treaty narrowly not to quite justify this part of the statute. There are, there are ways in which the court could decide for Mrs. Bond without quite overruling Missouri v. Holland. I am, if I had to predict, I bet they will take one of those routes, although I hope not. I'm hoping for a clean uh, holding that Missouri v. Holland is wrong. <laughs> it, it seems to me that um, Professor Rosecrans's argument, and as I recall, you say this explicitly in your article, the alternative that is available is to say the treaty is self-executing. And uh, I, I wonder if you could talk about two obvious objections to that. One is maybe we don't want all these treaties to be self-executing because it's committing us to a whole lot of things and we don't know in detail how that's going to work. And two, uh, it somewhat undermines a lot of your arguments because, after all, it is Congress, in effect, establishing a law by intriguing with foreigners and um, immediately preempting state law. But that seems actually to be in the Constitution. So why is that a so much more reassuring alternative? Uh, great. So that's an excellent question. Maybe to uh, frame it for the rest of the audience, we should get, again, self-executing and non-self-executing treaties on the table. The senator touched on this. Uh, there's thought there, there's this doctrine of non-self-executing treaties. The Article Six says that treaties shall be supreme law of the land. Uh, the a self-executing treaty is thought to be domestic law of its own force per that clause. So a self-executing treaty is has the force of a statute. It's like a U.S. statute here in the U.S. It's also like a contract with foreign nations. A non-self-executing treaty is just the contract part. It's just the international law promise that will then uh, enact some domestic law, change domestic law. So the question here is, um, uh, if I'm right that, this, uh, that a non-self-executing treaty can't increase the legislative power of Congress, won't we then be left with self-executing treaties? And is now worse? Isn't that worse? Those things are domestic law of their own uh, force. Now, I have a few different answers to that. So first of all, I'm actually agnostic as to the scope of the treaty power. And it may well be that some of the treaties that you are most worried about are would properly not fall within the Article II treaty power. And I'm sad to tell you the current conventional wisdom is that there are no subject matter limitations whatsoever on treaties. <laughs> but uh, but um, it may well be that that's wrong and that there ought to be subject matter limitations on uh, treaties. I haven't taken a position about that one way or the other. It's, uh, you know, I tend to think there probably should be such limits, but it's, it's difficult actually to figure out quite what they should be and what they ought to look like. Now, why am I less worried about, um, about self-executing treaties? I think just consider the political dynamic. So, you know, imagine a treaty that is self-executing of its own force going to, you know, create federal family law or something like that. You know, you could imagine state governors calling up their state senators, calling up Senator Cruz and saying, wait a second, you can't ratify this thing. This is going to preempt all of our local, all of our state family law. And, uh, you know, it likely successfully persuading Senator Cruz to vote against such a thing, right? Um, the non-self-executing treaty, though, with the Missouri Holland powers, much more insidious. So we, uh, you know, we have a treaty, and the treaty uh, speaks in very vague terms about, you know, regulating the, fam you know, uh, having family law that's in the best interest of the child or having disability law that's, you know, sympathetic to disabled people or whatever it is. And it's very um, uh, general and aspirational. And um, the, again, you can imagine the governor calling up Senator Cruz and saying, um, don't, don't do this. But you could imagine, perhaps not Senator Cruz, but another senator saying, um, don't worry. 
don't worry. This one's non-self-executing. It's going to have no effect at all on your domestic law. Your state law is fine. It's all, it's all, we're already in compliance with this. We enter into this non-self-executing treaty that we're already in compliance with. 10 years go by, 20 years go by, the thing sits around like a loaded gun. And then Congress takes it into its head to enact federal family law or enact, you know, enact laws regulating guns in your schools or whatever it is that Congress lacked the power to do. They have the power because they have this aspirational non-self-executing treaty sitting around. So I'm actually more nervous about them because they're kind of, it's a kind of insidious increase in federal power that's not, um, uh, the, the effect of which is non-obvious as we enter into the treaty. So that's why I'm actually more nervous about the non-self-executing mechanism. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, give that gentleman right over there. I, I think uh, Senator Cruz very well summarized the hierarchy of treaties relative to the Constitution as if it were the same as if it, a federal statute. Now, the question I have regarding the bond case and with any other case involving what is now a new cadre of treaties, regulatory treaties that are very prescriptive and detailed, where was, where were the state governments and the committees of the House and the Senate, one, when the treaty was being negotiated, two, when it was placed for a vote for ratification or a session, and three, where were the committees when implementing legislation was being drafted? other than the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, so is that, I don't know if that's That's to you, yours. Professor. Oh, it is. <laughs> uh, uh, where were they, meaning why were they not raising federalism concerns? Why were they not holding hearings, picking apart the treaty, looking at it, stretching it out um, into, into all types of dimensions to see what might happen? So these are politically popular things, many of them. You know, take this, you know, this disabilities treaty that was um, uh, referenced before, right? Nobody's, n no, nobody's opposed to rights for disabled people. It's a, as a political matter, it's kind of politically popular. And if you get the reassurance that this is all non-self-executing and isn't going to have an effect on domestic law anyway, you can sort of understand but, but, how the politics But that's politics. Would we're, talking play out. About, we're talking about constitutional duties of con congressional committees. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not a politician. But, but, no, the reason I say this is because we worked together in Heritage my organization and others six years ago to raise issues dealing with the Law of the Sea Treaty, okay? Nobody in Congress went and conducted any hearings other than Senate Foreign Relations. We had the odds stacked against us. You had 17 to 4 vote in Senate Foreign Relations Committee. You had a Democratic Congress solid. You had a Bush administration that wanted the treaty, and yet we prevailed because we raised questions. Mm -hmm. This is a template for every single treaty that goes that that, it, that an administration submits for consideration. Good for you. But the point, though, is, is that nobody. <laughs> no, so honestly, no, that's important work. That's good. I, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I, Lawrence and I worked together uh, back in '07 on on the first round, and you know this all came up again last year, where the Foreign Relations Committee had four hearings, uh, one of which I testified at. Um, you know, I think you're just gravely overestimating the the interest and uh, of of uh, of House and and, and Senate uh, members and their committees, and you know the idea that you know, they would stomp on each other's toes on other committees when Senate Foreign Relations has primary jurisdiction. It's tough. It's tough to get them to, to direct their attention towards uh, anything. Um, but uh, you know, we continue to be vigilant. We continue to fight against these things. We've rolled back uh, uh, several treaties that have been up for a vote. The Disabilities Treaty was defeated uh, last December, although they're looking to take another round at it again. And last year, after four hearings, Senator Kerry was, uh, was so pushed back by our efforts uh, that he didn't even bother to have a vote at the committee level on it. Of course, he was kind of busy trying to run for, to be the next Secretary of State at the time, uh, but it, it didn't happen. And this, this goes into my broader idea that you know, the treaty, the treaty power, there doesn't seem to be any textual constraints on it. <laughs> right now, there doesn't seem to be any constraint on Congress from whatever they, implementing legislation they put. So it really com comes down to groups like uh, the Heritage Foundation and other organizations to hold the feet to the fire of members of the Senate who would otherwise uh, give their consent to ratification of treaties that would seem to be uh, politically popular or would make them feel good.
if they gave their consent. So it's down to the American people, civil society, activists, uh, to raise these issues. And so far, we've been very successful, and I hope we continue to be so. Yeah. And let me just add to that. Uh, my, my First of all, uh, my thanks to our two panelists, but also a comment uh, on what we do here in the in the Edwin Meese III Legal Center. We do provide these educational opportunities, such as our Preserve the Constitution series, and we are all lucky to have senators like Senator Cruz that take the time mm -hmm. to educate the public on these issues and keep them live. And, and of course, there are a number of students in the audience. Learn about these issues. Ask your teachers about these issues. Um, and remain engaged with the civic process. So once again, thank you to uh, Professor Rosencrantz and, and, and Steve Groves as well. Thank you.